You are listening to the All Star Charts Podcast with JC Peretz on TechnicalAnalysisRadio.com. All right, everybody, we are back, and today we are joined by a newly minted CMT, Mr. David Zarling. David, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me on, JC. This is pretty awesome. So I've been following your work for years now, and uh, you know, you reached out to me recently to sponsor you for your uh, CMT. You just passed your level three. Congratulations. Yeah, hey, thanks, man. I like the sound of the newly minted. It sounds good. It sounds nice. <laughs> Yourself, Tom Bruni, uh, Ian McMillan, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of friends out there kind of finishing their uh, process. But the reality of the matter is we're all just really getting going. You know, we're all relatively young. We're early in our careers. And, um, you know, we have a, a lot ahead of us. Um, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what you're doing? You're doing some publishing. Uh, you've got an RIA. You know, talk to me about your, uh, you know, your week to week stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, a lot of some people can be familiar with my stuff on Twitter at, at 360 Research. You know, I like to post charts, I like to comment about the market. You know, that's the publishing side. Uh, we kept that as a separate uh, entity next to the RAA. Our RAA is Client First Tax and Wealth Advisors. We've been doing that for several years now. You know, we manage about uh, roughly 77 million for about 200 households. Um, we think technical analysis is the way to manage risk appropriately for households. You know, especially if you're if you're talking people near and in retirement, it's a, it's a much different gig than people who are in their 20s and 30s can handle a little more volatility right out markets. Um, but yeah, the CMT thing that's been been fantastic. I truly appreciate your your sponsor, you know, your support and sponsorship. That means a lot to me. I I feel fortunate to be in the class that I'm in. You know, if they call them CMT classes, there's some pretty pretty stellar uh solid individuals that are coming out of this group so i'm excited to be a part of that yeah absolutely you mentioned uh using technical analysis as an ria and you know particularly to manage risk can you tell me a little bit about what that process looks like how do you use technicals to manage risks for uh for your clients sure sure um you know it can be anything from from simple uh making sure well let me start let me start from if I can talk from a little bit of, from an aspect of, it's one thing for you and me to talk technicals, right? And it's it's a different thing for me to talk to about a, to a potential client or a client who who doesn't have a CMT or isn't versed on some of those things. And so you have to take you have to take someone from a point of curiosity because we talk about managing risk to a point of en- of enlightenment. Um, and we can do that by simply talking about some simple things like price, you know, economic law, supply and demand. More supply than demand, price drops. More demand than supply, price rises. We can see this on charts. We can also use it to identify trends. You know, we can talk about um, trends being identified by simply looking at the past 40 weeks of information averaged. You know, if you make the comparison of you know keeping track of your own grocery bill on a weekly basis and averaging that over 40 weeks, you can get an idea of is your grocery bill in an uptrend or is your grocery bill in a downtrend. You know, we can educate our clients on you know we want to be invested with uptrends we do not want to be invested with downtrends um and then we can use information to identify relative strength right we've got it's america it's a beautiful place we've got thirty thousand things we could potentially invest in whether it's an etf mutual fund you name it stock bond so how do we possibly identify what to put in the portfolio so we can walk our, our our potential clients or our clients through the process of you know how do we identify where the strength in the market is right and we can use that using ratios you know we could point out you know i like to cover with i just have my clients take the coke pepsi challenge right i take a a, a ratio chart of coke stock versus pepsi stock and we just walk through the ratio and say you know should we be owning coke stock here or should we be owning pepsi stock and then we can look at that from a bigger picture right we can we think about markets like a loaf of bread, you know, a lot of places slice it horizontally and we've got large cap, mid cap, small caps. We can also slice it traditionally, you know, vertically. And we've got the technology slice. We've got an industrial slice. We've got uh, energy slice and you go on and on down the sectors and we can do that Coke Pepsi analysis, right? We can do that relationship analysis to each one and identify both what we want to own and also the moldy pieces, what we don't want to own. And then just getting into, you know, risk management gets simply into when there is too much risk compared to reward. And we can identify that by just simply, you know, if we've got two common moving averages, such as the 50 and 200 day moving down, 
you know, maybe maybe there's a little bit more risk in in the market than there needs to be. Obviously, you can't use those as hard signals, but those are some of the tools that we can use to communicate, you know, risk management. When there's too much too much risk in the market, we don't need to be involved with it. We we can land the plane. You know, I think we've heard Dave Keller say things like, you know, we can be on the ground. We'd rather be on the ground wishing we were in the air than the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And and what about the sort of evolution of your process? I mean, this it wasn't it wasn't always like this. Was this did you find this out of necessity, or was it just kind of like you just kept seeing what worked better? How how did awesome. you get to where you are today? Awesome, awesome question. So, first thing, you were a big part of that, just because I, I came across your work, and I can't pinpoint the exact year. You, I'm guessing you started writing in eleven or twelve, but um, going back further than that. You know, if you think about, I've been involved with markets in the, since the early 2000s. So I've been through the dot-com bust, great financial crisis. You know, those were, you know, great and interesting times. I would consider myself back then leading up to like 2006-ish to be kind of a fusion, meaning I understood technicals, I used them, but I was also deep into the fundamental side. And when you looked at 2006 and 2007 during that time frame, you're sitting there looking at the fundamentals saying there's something not right, but yet price continues to rise. And that's career risk, right? Like if you're out of the market and the market continues to rally another 30%, that's a problem. The other way, right, on the flip side, 08, 09, when that's collapsing and taking out, you know, I, I don't care what you say, but it's not in the best interest of a 65 year old to ride that out. And so the evolution of that process really came from, um, 0809, uh, completely saying, you know what, buy and hold while it's a, it is appropriate for some people, it's not appropriate for uh, pre retirees and retirees because you can't have your portfolio cut in half and expect to have a, a, a bona fide retirement plan. And then leading up to it's really things really started to click when I came across your work, JC. Uh, you, you know, I, I think you were just getting started in 2012, but some of your ratio work, um, just simple things like how we use RSI, looking for RSI divergences, keeping it simple, just using price, one indicator, maybe looking at what direction the 200 day moving averages is going at. Like for example, right now, you know, flat 200 day moving averages, of course the market's gonna be a little bit messy. Um, you know, you, you would call it a hot mess, but I, you know, so you are a big part of that. So I gotta thank you for that because that solidified our process to the point now where we do give our, process here a name we call it the adaptive investment management system because we're going to adapt to different market conditions right markets are never the same um, which is the beauty of them they can be in an uptrend no trend downtrend and we have to adapt to that and so really it's been a growing process and just you know I think you know this the longer you're involved with markets the, the more experience you get the more you understand how quickly risk happens and you have to have a way to manage that and technical analysis helps us do that yeah, I, I think this, I think this is a great topic that I, I wish you know I wish I I, I would have uh, have more perspective from the financial advisor you know the technician community um, than we've had up to now uh, in in the podcast in the past. But now that we're on the subject, I think it's I think it's fantastic. So from the perspective of a financial advisor, how do you then when you're when you're making decisions when you're making changes? I mean, I love the the comparison, the Coke, Pepsi, to sort of use that as a springboard to then explain other things. Um, what other sorts of uh, conversations are you having with clients specifically regarding technical analysis? Well, you know, that that's a good example. Um, you know, I think in, overall we want to talk about just for us, focus on the, on the signal and avoid the noise, right? We have strong conversations about how while the media has a job to do, we need to understand that the media is not working in our best interest. Uh, they're working in their best interest. And so we have to have a way to navigate through that environment, right? There's a lot of crap out there, a lot of noise, right? And as, an, in, as a retail investor, that's a, it's an incredibly noisy arena. You know, when things happen in the market, when there's more selling than buying, it's as simply as that, you know, simple as that, people start looking for answers right like why did that happen we have strong conversations about price moves first then news happens right because these guys have a job to do 
they've got to get on TV. They got to talk for 24 hours about the market. And if you put me on for TV for 24 hours, I'm going to make some crap up. You know, I'm going to make up comments about, oh, I think it's because of trade deal or whatever. When it could just simply be someone's in the market selling and there's more selling than buying going on. And that's simply it. But, you know, the going back to the Coke Pepsi analysis, that that's a big one. I, I use I, I tell people all the time I use a lot of food analogies, you know, because, for example, when we want to put a portfolio together, it's very much like going to the grocery store. Right. We want to have a well-rounded meal. You know, we want to we want to. But we also want to think like a chef. Price is important, but the grapes might be cheap because they're moldy. And we have to have an, a way to identify freshness and seasonality. You know, my second my second oldest. Uh, her favorite food is is watermelon. It's not. It's like not even close. Like the second <laughs> favorite food, it's watermelon's the thing. Well, her birthday's in March, right? Well, March and watermelon, at least in Wisconsin, not a great combo. But she gets her fill in July and August, and so we can talk with clients through that. They get it. Oh yeah, July, August, watermelons in season. Now in markets, it may not be as static as oh yeah, you can count on this one area of the market to be in season you know, somewhere between January 1st and 31st, but they get it when we start talking about two year periods to 10 year periods that there's these massive shifts in capital. And we can identify that just simply by using ratio analysis. Wow, I love the watermelon uh, analogy, that's hysterical. And then what about what about some of the inner market stuff? I mean, I, I can't imagine these conversations being very easy because I know your work and I know how you look at markets similar to me, right? As you mentioned, I appreciate what you said before. When you're having conversations about like other asset classes, like if you're looking at maybe currency ratios, you know, and they're like, why on earth should I care what the yen is doing, right? Like some of these conversations, how do you incorporate that sort of stuff, you know, some of these commodities and, and currencies? Sure. You know, we can we could talk about, you know, uh, kind of similar in a process that you go through on a monthly basis. I know you do a really great job with your monthly conference calls and it, it Full disclosure, you know, I subscribe to your work, um, and and I encourage anybody listening to to do that because one of the things that's great about going through that process for your monthly conference call, I think you'd agree with this, is that it solidifies your thought processes and your thesis. So same way, on a quarterly basis, I do that for my clients. And so, for example, in the last quarterly uh, presentation I did, we did talk about what do what do asset managers do when they need to hide or they need to protect the capital that they're working in because you know we're small we're small peanuts compared to the guys managing billions um and so if they're looking for a safe place to go they're going to go gold bonds yen so if we look at those do you know do they give us any type of insight um so we can look at those three asset classes and say wow okay if they're all ripping well then that could be kind of signaling that there's a shift in capital away from risk. And they get it. Once you explain to them how that asset class is used or that specific vehicle is used, then they understand it. Um, we also talk a lot about how each asset class or chart has to stand on its own merit. I think I actually learned that from Peter Brandt. But, you know, energy stocks, right? Energy stocks have been a dog for, man, how long? But oil right at the beginning of this year not a bad uh, full disclosure we were we were in oil from february until a couple weeks ago you can identify where their strength is but you you, you obviously energy stocks are going to do well if oil's doing well but they're not completely correlated you can have one doing well while the other one is not you just have to be have a way to identify when that is I was on India TV yesterday and I called American energy stocks the European banks of uh, of America. They both just <laughs> horrible places to be. And like, uh, I didn't even like plan that. I was just like speaking from the heart. I mean, they just it, both been such terrible places. Yeah, it's bad. Like when, when are those European financials going to come back? And didn't, the, I think the Deutsche Bank even dropped out at the lowest price yesterday or something like that. It continues just to be a mess over there. Yeah, I mean, listen, they have their moments and their their counter trend moves are, are interesting. I mean, listen, that may have been it. You know, Deutsche Bank retesting those late yeah. December lows. Yeah. Nice, successful retest. Um, yep. This podcast being recorded on the 10th of May of 2019. And uh, this week, European banks, uh, surprise, surprise, had a, had, did not have a very good week. Um, but uh, perhaps Deutsche Bank 
putting in a double bottom, which if that's the yep. case, I mean, listen, if European banks are going up, I mean, stocks in general got to be doing well in that environment. What do you think, Mr. Zarling? Oh, yeah. I mean, hey, you know, if you're going to have one of the largest financial institutions bottoming out and getting accumulated, that can't be bad for you. I mean, you want in Europe, you want European financials to lead, right? You know, in, in the U.S., it's not the largest sector, but you want financials to participate over in Europe. You want them to lead. And so you want to see, you know, a ratio of like EUFM versus IEV. You want to see that strength come from that ratio. And, you know, it's interesting on an absolute basis, if you look at EUFN, there, there is some, you know, telltale signs of accumulation. And I find that interesting. I find it interesting that when there was weakness in the U.S. this week, that we kind of saw Germany and Europe pulled up. You know, it, that's a, I think that's an interesting uh, development, not something that we had seen before. And what, what other sorts of themes are you talking about with clients right now? I mean, we're heading into, I guess we can say that we're probably approaching the beginning of the doldrums of summer, should I say? What's wrong with a little consolidation? We've had a really nice beginning to the year, um, you know, to keep that pace up, you know, while nice, it, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's a healthy thing because at some point you have reversion that happens fast. Um, so what's wrong with a little pullback, uh, some weakness in summer and some basing, you know, we take it day by day, you know, we take a Bayesian approach as the new data comes in, we have, you know, new developments and thesis, you know, one thing that you've been talking about, you know, is the dollar. Uh, we talk about the dollar strength. Um, if there's, if there's dollar weakness, um, obviously I think that helps emerging markets. Um, could be a potential, you know, when I look like a ratio of like VEU versus SPY, you know, there's some characteristics there where, okay, I'm not saying it is a bottom, but there, there's some potential there. You've got an RSI divergence, you've got price near lows. Um, are we going to start seeing a shift here, right? Because if we see the dollar fall apart um, or at least get sold, that should mean a benefit to international stocks. Uh, Personally, as an asset manager, I would love that, some differentiation, right? And so it's been the U.S. for how long now? Um, I wouldn't mind it if, if international started to lead. If we had another like 2003 to 2007 where we had commodities, you know, going and we had international stocks going along with, and obviously that's bullish for the U.S. too. Um, I could see, you can kind of see that potential there. I'm not saying that's what's happening, but if the dollar starts to fall off here and we start to see commodities get a bid and certain areas internationally get a, get a bid because of the dollar weakness, um, I don't see a problem with that. Let's participate in it. I mean, the dollar's been flat all year. I mean, full disclosure, I've been waiting for the rollover and it hasn't come, hasn't right. rallied, but hasn't come, you know, you're, you know, but then you're seeing Euro and uh, pound sterling starting to make some moves. So, I mean, I'm I'm still optimistic for that U.S. dollar rollover. Now let's flip that script. What if the U.S. dollar doesn't roll over? We rip to new highs, and you got another five, six, seven points in the Dixie. I yeah. can't imagine stocks doing too well in that no. environment. No way. No. Yeah, that's going to be a struggle, right? You know, I I don't I don't I don't think that's necessarily. I don't know what the the news story is behind that. I don't really care. Uh, but you know, a dollar, a dollar rising or ripping like that above these, you know, let's call it 98 level. That's, that's going to just be a headwind, a struggle for equities. That's, you know, that would be my thesis on it too. I think, I think that would be a hard road or a flat road, or maybe even a down road for us equities in, in that type of environment. What about recently? You said something to me that uh, there's a little something for everyone. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know there's a little bit of weakness this week. Um, you know, let, let's take it, you, you know, one of the great thing, you know, another thing you taught me now that this is triggering me here, the, the top down approach, right? That's, that's a big deal. You know, so if you step back, you know, if we take a top down approach and we step back in time frame and we look at like a weekly chart of, let's say the queues, right? And we see that today's, you know, Friday, our weekly close is below the weekly high closes from 2018. That's a little bit worrisome. So that's, that's one in the in the cap for the bears, uh, you know. But if we narrow it down to the near term, you know, we still have, for example, a rising 50-day moving average, um, and you've got a, a nice 
nice hammer candles everywhere today. I know everybody was talking about those, and those don't mean jack squat until we've got follow through. Just a reminder to everybody. Um, you can have all the hammer candles you want, but if you don't have follow through on that hammer candle, it means nothing. Um, so there's a little bit of something. I, I think it's a mixed bag. You know, another thing we look at uh, bullish percent, right? That's a point and figure process. We're at midfield. We just the world uh, bullish percent index just flipped to O's, which simply means that now we are in a sell signal for the amount of stocks that are, are in a buy signal across the world. So about 40%, if I'm looking at this, I'm going to pull this up here, 40%-ish of world uh, stocks, there's about 23,000 members of those are in a buy. So it's a mixed market. You know, you have some bifurcation. You've got, you know, it's a, it's a stock picker's market, and there's nothing wrong with that either. Isn't it always a stock picker's market, or do you think that it, you, you're in the camp that when, you know, volatility spikes and correlations really just spike, but we haven't had that in a while. So I feel like 90% plus of the time, 95% plus, it's always a stock picker's market. You could be in, 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 most stocks are ripping. If you're in the wrong stocks, right? If you've been in yeah. energy stocks and not in tech. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, yeah, you can, there's definitely, hey, opportunity cost is real, you know, and so, yeah, you got to make sure that you are, if you're doing stocks, you're picking the right stocks, you're doing sectors that you're picking the right sectors. You cannot hold on to a dog for too long or else you're getting crushed uh, on a relative basis. Um, but yeah, to your point, you know, it, you, you want to own the strengths, buy the strength. So if you're going to, it is it is always a stock picker's market. That's a great point. I, I guess to me, you know, there are periods of time where everything's getting bid. Um, and that's a broad market and there's times where it's mixed you know it's the the lebrons of the world and the james harden of the world are leading the market you know and that's a that's a good thing too you can have narrow markets and that still be a positive thing yeah 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 your best player scoring uh the majority of the points that's perfectly normal um yep. in, in uptrends and that's that's something i've picked up from colleagues and uh, predecessors of mine over the years, uh, most certainly. I've actually noticed you, I mean, you and I, we met in San Diego a few years back. You were recently, yep. um, you came to Chart Summit in Breckenridge, which was uh, awesome, so much Dude, fun. You guys did a great job with that. What, oh man, I. if you guys do that again, people need to get to that because what a great way to do it. I mean, to ski during the day and then charts in the evening and afternoon, like, does it get better? I don't know. I don't know if it gets better than that. It was a lot of fun. You guys did a great job with that. Well, I appreciate that. It's not like me and Brian are, uh, you know, Mr. Event Throwers over here. Um, you know, we just want to look at our charts and, and and do some skiing. And, you know, we're just very lucky um, how awesome it actually turned out. So we're very fortunate in that. And then I just saw you recently at the CMT Symposium yeah. in New York City as well. So you've been yeah. you've been making your rounds. Um you know what 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 drives you to you know show up at these things Are you learning you're meeting people yeah yeah there's there's multiple reasons right um you know i i don't know what uh you and and morgan get to talk about but it's not it's not like i get to go into anybody you know like my buddy's house or i go over to you know and and, and talk with my wife my wife and i talk about different things we don't get to sit we don't sit there and talk markets her, her eyes would roll in the back of her head and so for me, it's getting around uh, like-minded individuals. You know, I don't, I don't expect other people in my life to have those same passions and understand those same things. And so I, there's times where you, you have this natural desire to get around people that challenge your thinking, um, you know, because if, if someone's truly an open-minded technician, right, they're going to be able to, like you said, uh, you know, think but it, oppositely, if the dollar does this, what happens? If the dollar does that, what happens? Um, and if you're around other open-minded technicians like that, it can challenge your own thesis a little bit, and that and that's a good thing. Um, plus, I mean, the CMT symposium that was just that was great, and I, and I think it getting around other industry, right? Because I I'm just standing kind of on the shoulders of guys like you. Um, we're standing on the shoulders of guys like Ralph Alcampora, Luis Yamada. Like there's all these technicians that came before us that, you know, because none of the stuff I'm using is like earth shattering and 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 new. It's stuff that I learned from you. It's stuff that I learned from Peter Brandt. So these different events that are going on, I want to get to them because I want to have conversations with people that think in that 
framework, if you will. A lot of people out there, you know, they they always wonder. I mean, I've I've just been very lucky. I, I guess I've been, you know, I lived in New York for so long, so a lot of events essentially came to me, and then ultimately we started doing stuff, going to places in California. Um, but I was just lucky to just kind of in New York be able to always be surrounded, you know, by smart people. And I guess I take that for granted. What about other people who don't really go out of their way to make it to some of this stuff? What do you What do you have to say to them? Oh, uh, you know, maybe maybe think differently about it because um, no matter what you're going to, um, you're always going to get a nugget, or maybe you're going to get a connection with with a group of individuals. You know, I I think about you know running into guys like Patrick and you know Steve Straza, um, getting a chance to talk to a guy like you. Like it's not every day that someone just could, just gets to come and talk to J.C. Peretz. Um, and 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 kind of pick his brain about what he's thinking about the markets. And so, to those who who don't make the trip, just you know, I would just say go, just go and do it. Um, talk to people. You, you will not regret it. The experiences you have, whether it's talking about markets or even just talking about, you know, hey JC, how's your how's your wine thing going? You know, or 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 whatever. It, it, there's lots of different opportunities to talk about different things, and we're all. Most technicians I know are syntopic learners, meaning they're able to apply different aspects of their life together. And that makes for great conversation. So come out, learn something new, um, you know, come out to Chart Summit. If you guys are doing that again, I come out to that, come out to the CMT Symposium. You, you're gonna come away with nothing but good things. What are you doing now to improve and learn more? You're done with your CMT, you know, you're focused on your business. Uh, I mean, obviously you're going uh, on, on on various trips and listening to presentations, but what about at, at home? What are you reading? What are you consuming these days? Well, right now I'm, I'm, re I'm going through uh, market wizards again. Nice. Um, yeah, it, it, that's such a good, oh man, there's so much, you know, I, I'm sure most of the listeners to on here have, have read that book, but there's so many good books to go back to, but that's one I'm reading right now. Um, I think just being involved in markets themselves on a daily basis and challenging your thesis um, is one way to stay sharp. Uh, you know, great podcasts like yours is just a way to uh, learn. Um, you know, like one of the ways that I use your uh, service, JC, is I use it to, um, it's, this brings up another thought that crossed my head about um, how did I get to this point? Um, and same thing with studying for the CMT. Uh, you, you might be familiar with Matthew Verdal, right? Uh, yeah. Through Optuma, and he has his education course for the CMT. What was beneficial about that is it provided a framework for learning, right? And so same thing with the stuff that you're putting out, JC, is it's a framework for learning. It's, it's, an, it's one thing to have a thought, but to organize your thoughts is a different thing. And so that's something that both you and Matthew have done very, very well. Um, and so I use your I use your research to continue to learn, to continue to challenge myself. Um, but yeah, reading, uh, podcasts, you name it, I'm all over it. You mentioned the Market Wizards books. You know, one of the common themes that you'll find chapter after chapter from all of the different people he interviews, uh, that Schwager interviews, is risk management. You notice that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every oh, yeah. single one. <laughs> yep. It's job number one, man. Risk management is job number one. I think sometimes we forget that. And by the way, it's not just one. I mean, there's the original Market Wizards book, but then there's like the Hedge Fund Market Wizards. I suggest read them all. They're all so good. Um, and and it's, it's really interesting finding the common denominators between all of them, what makes them all so successful. But one of the also interesting things about uh, the Market Wizards books is that while they, they all are focused on managing risk, right, rule number one, like you said, um, mm -hmm. All of their strategies are all completely different, yeah, um, yeah. but would still focus on the risk management. I find so interesting. Yeah, all of them. Yes, exactly right. All of them, different styles, whether it's some type of moving average or trend that they're they're taking on, but they all super aggressive in protecting their capital, and that that and that really drives home in in that in that book for sure. And I do have the hedge fund one lined up next. Nice, it's that. a good one for sure. Yeah. Um, yep. All right, so we have a lot of financial advisors out there listening all over the world for that matter, but definitely in North America. As a technical analyst, um, as a CMT and somebody who's 
practices it every single day in uh, in your own firm. Uh, any advice you have out there to financial advisors that might be interested in perhaps learning more about technical analysis or maybe getting getting over that hump to you know really dive into our world? What do you say to them? Yeah, no, um, you know every everything is a process. Uh, you, you know you're seeking out um, the way I would describe technical analysis and and why I think uh, advisors should give a really serious look at it is um it's a light it's a light in market darkness uh you know there's a lot of opinion out there and none of it is fact and the beauty of technical analysis is price is fact you can't really argue with it and so you know there's man for financial advisors there's so many different conferences there's so many you're getting bombarded non-stop with different strategies uh, different pieces of information, how you should be doing things, how you should diversify, how you should identify risk. Um, the beauty of technical analysis is it simplifies that whole process for you and it's scalable. Um, you know, I, the majority of financial advisors, and, and I'm not just throwing this out there off, off the cuff, there's research on this. And I'll give an example. I ran into someone yesterday who was talking about an RRA that has 1,100 holdings. I don't know how you manage that. I don't know how you manage 1,100 holdings. Uh, that that's crazy, you know. Uh, so I, you know, so do you have a process to scale your business? And technical analysis can do that. And so if if you're looking for ways to learn more about technical analysis, uh, you know, shameless plug for you, I read your blog. You know, consider subscribing to the information you're putting out. Um, listen to different podcasts. You know, this one you're you're you focus on purely technical, that's awesome. They should be listening to this podcast. Um, CMT, they can go online and read about it. In fact, you know, I thought Tom, your your buddy Tom did a great job kind of laying out the CMT, like why he thought about doing it. Read that. Um, you could link that in your show notes. Um, but I highly recommend it because supply and demand price is the final arbiter of value. And it helps cut through all the noise, which there's a ton of in our industry, just un unbelievable amounts of noise and price cuts through all of it. Well, David, I appreciate all the uh, kind words. I, I, I didn't even, uh, I should be paying you uh, for, uh, for all these promos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like nonstop, right? <laughs> so thank you for that though, it means a yeah. lot. And again, congratulations on, uh, on passing the CMT and thank you for uh, being here on the show, I really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the All-Star Charts Podcast with J.C. Peretz on Technical Analysis Radio. To see all of the charts mentioned on today's show, please visit allstarcharts.com slash podcast.